In the last video, I showed you kind of an involved derivation of how to do inverse kinematics for orientation given that your robot has a spherical wrist. This video is focused on how you use those equations or that information in order to apply inverse kinematics for orientation to your particular robot. You don't actually have to re-derive those equations every time uh, you want to apply this and set the orientation of your robot's end effector. You just have to know how to apply these equations. And the procedure for application is a fairly simple six step procedure. So in this video, I'm going to give you those six steps and a little bit of an example of how you use them. Step number one is to set what you want R06 to be. In the last video, I showed you an example of how to set R36 to be what you want it to be. But in the general case, your robot will have six joints, three joints that are the arm of the robot that set the end effector's position, and three other joints that are for setting its orientation. So what you really want to control is actually R06. That's the orientation or rotation of the end effector relative to the base frame, or in other words, relative to the floor. The way that you do that is the same way that I showed you how to set R36, except you're actually going to compare the frame number 6 to the base frame instead of frame number 3. Let me show you briefly what I mean by that. Here I've shown a complete kinematic diagram for a six degree of freedom manipulator. I want you to notice first of all that the six frame is not in the same orientation as the zero frame. If we wanted to have the six frame be rotated in such a way that it's in the same orientation as the, uh, as the frame zero, then we could set the rotation matrix 0, 6 to be equal to uh, the matrix that indicates no rotation, which is a matrix called the identity matrix that looks like this. This matrix means no rotation. If I set R06 to be like this, I'm saying that I want my end effector to be rotated in such a way that it matches the orientation of the zero frame, so that Y6 is in the same direction as Y0, so that X6 is in the same direction as X0, and so that Z6 is in the same direction as Z0. If I want the end effector to be oriented in any other fashion, I can specify that with R06 by multiplying on rotation matrices that represent some degree of rotation around one of the zero axes. For example, if I wanted the Y6 axis to be pointed into the screen and have the X6 axis pointed to the right with the Z6 axis still pointing up, then I would multiply this matrix times a 90 degree rotation around Z. By doing these multiplications of a series of rotations, I can specify R06 to be any rotation I want the uh, six frame to have relative to the base frame. Once I have a matrix for R06 
with actual numbers, not variables, in each of these positions, then I can move on to step two of my procedure. Step two in the procedure is something that we've already learned how to do. Step two is to use forward kinematics just on the first three joints. Remember, the first three joints are the ones that are responsible for positioning the end effector in order to get the rotation matrix R03. I'm not going to go into detail on how to do this here because we've already seen how to do that in previous videos. Instead, I'm going to move on to step three of the procedure. Step three is to calculate the matrix R36 using the equation that I've shown here. R36 is equal to the inverse of the matrix R03 times the matrix R06. You, by uh, step three in this procedure, you already have matrix R03 from step two of the procedure, and you already have R06 from step one of the procedure. So this part of inverse kinematics is just simply an inverting of a matrix and then multiplying two matrices together. Both of these operations can be done in MATLAB or in your calculator simply by plugging in these the values for these matrices. So step three is pretty simple, it's just a calculation. Once you have the matrix R36, you can move on to step four. Step four is where you're going to calculate the first angle of your wrist, theta five. We do this calculation by using those equations that we derived in the first video of this topic series. And I made a mistake in this equation, so I'm going to correct that real quickly here. It's not 1, 1. It should be element 3, 3. Putting 3, 3 in the parentheses here means that this is the element of the matrix that I want to go get. I want to get the element that's in the third row and the third column of the matrix R3, 6. Once I've gone and got that element, I calculate the arc cosine of that element and take the negative of it, and that gives me the value for theta 5. Now remember that I already have matrix R3, 6 because I got that from step 3 of the procedure. So all that this step requires is to get the element of this matrix that is in the third row and the third column calculate the arc cosine of it and take the negative and then you'll have theta 5. In step 5 of the procedure we have to start by doing we're going to start by checking to see if theta 5 that we got from step 4 is equal to either 0 or a multiple of 180. If theta 5 is either 0 or a multiple of 180, we can then go ahead and set theta 4 equal to 0 and we can calculate theta 6 equal to the arc cosine of R36 element 1, 1. I got this equation very simply by pulling out one of those expressions that we derived when finding the matrix R36 in the previous, um, in the previous video. And then by plugging into that uh, uh, expression in row 1, column 1, theta 4 equals 0 and theta 5 equals 0 or a multiple of 180. And this equation is what comes out of that. So that's where this equation came from. 
if theta 5 is equal to 0 or a multiple of 180 and we do this step, then we're finished. We've found values for theta 5, theta 4, and theta 6. However, if theta 5 was not equal to 0 or a multiple of 180, we have to do step 6 instead. In step 6, which we do if theta 5 is not equal to 0 or a multiple of 180, in that case, theta 4 is equal to the arc cosine of uh, R36, the value that's in row 2, column 3, divided by the sine of theta 5. You can understand now why we would not want to do this if theta 5 was equal to 0 or a multiple of 180. In that case, the sine of theta 5 would be 0, and we can't divide by 0. And so this is a calculation that we use only in the case that the sine of theta 5 is not equal to 0. Likewise, step 6 also includes a calculation for theta 6. Here, we're going to go get the element in R36 that is in row 3, column 2. We take the negative of that value and then divide by the sine of theta 5. We can use this 6-step procedure any time that we have a spherical wrist to avoid having to do the derivation from the first video every time we have a, uh, a new manipulator. We can simply apply this list of six steps to whatever manipulator we have as long as it has a spherical wrist.